Hi, today we are going to review the Siglen STS 1104XE Digital Oscilloscope. It's an entry level 4 channel 100 MHz rated oscilloscope with either dual 1 GB samples or quad 500 MHz samples per second. I agreed on doing this review since I needed a scope with support for additional digital probes. Siglent gave me that scope for free and requested an honest review with no strings attached. I don't receive any money, but I was able to arrange a giveaway of another unit to a lucky subscriber. So stick until the end for the details. I will split this review into two parts since there are really many features. In this part I will show all basic functionality provided by the standalone scope and in the next part I will review the logic analyzer and the network features. Let's get started with the basics and I will try to use some of my projects to show how I would use it in practice. If you are just interested in specific topics, there is a clickable index in the description. The scope comes with a power and an USB cord, a quick start guide, a calibration certificate and four probes. The quick start guide is a good starting point to get familiar with the generic functionalities of the scope. However, if you like the full deal, you can get the complete manual as a PDF and print it. Look at this, this is huge, it's almost as big as the scope itself. That indicates the amount of functionality the scope evolved into. The probes come with a characteristics sheet and as we would expect at this price point are of basic quality. However, they are good enough for anything I'm doing in my lab here. We can switch between times 1 and times 10. Included are some color rings, a short ground spring, some caps for better aim and a small screwdriver to adjust the probe compensation. But what about the scope? Let's turn it on, not take it apart. The startup time is 25 seconds. The fan noise is moderate. And this is when I speak. It feels quite sturdy with a retained handle, some good quality rubber feet adjustable feet in the front and nice connectivity options on the backside that we will discuss later. It doesn't have a physical power button, just a soft button, probably to allow storing our settings on shutdown. When turned off the power button is softly dimming in and out. It looks cool but not so my thing. It's unnecessary power consumption and light pollution. It has a 7 inch screen with 800 by 480 resolution. No touchscreen that, if you ask me, really needs to be introduced to entry-level scopes. Instead we have a row of function buttons and a general purpose knob. The probe buttons are lit by their individual color which is fixed. The encoder knobs have a cheap plasticky look but work quite well. The small knobs are stepless. This is good for smooth positioning. The general purpose one can also be used to select options from menus. When pushing it to select the option, it can happen that it jumps to another one. The control area is well organized into general functionalities. The vertical section consists of functionality that shows plots and their vertical scaling. The horizontal area covers the time scaling, role and event search. Then we have the trigger controls and up there anything else. The connections down there are another USB port for your thumb drive or an optional function generator the serial bus for the digital probes and the calibration point which I would rather have somewhere else on the side. It's quite crowded if we connect more than one probe there. The probe connectors are simple BNC with no extra contacts. In general the UI is quite clean. Compared to my Rigel scope a bigger portion of the screen is used to display the actual signals. And that's what the scope is for, isn't it? The title bar is narrow showing vertical scale and delay. On the right side we find the sampling rate, the displayed samples, trigger settings and each vertical probe scaling and positioning. At the bottom the currently active functions are displayed. The first four measurements are just displayed above this. The display button can be used to hide the menu for cleaner screenshots. If we are displaying measurement statistics those are even moved to the empty space. Quite impressive attention to detail if you ask me. On the right side we have the current connectivity displayed. By connecting a thumb drive we can easily take a screenshot using the print button. Despite being shortly mentioned in the manual, my old printer didn't work. I didn't find any additional info which printers are supported. The menus are quite consistent and self-explanatory. 
What I really approve is the additional help that's placed all over the functions and also hidden on long press of a button. At this price point the scope is targeting let's say semi-professionals like me. It's quite handy to have all the help just in place. The self-calibration takes around 6.5 minutes. Let's connect the probe and do some measurements. The channels are enabled pressing the button once. Pressing twice disables them again. That's also consistent with other modes on the scope. We can attach a 50 MHz oscillator that should be comfortably in the operating range. In the probe menu we can select the coupling, the 20 MHz bandwidth limitation, the vertical adjustment step size, which also can be changed by pushing the big knob. Then we have the probe factor. On the second page we can change the display to amps, compensate SQ, invert the signal and set the position, which is more conveniently done using the small knob. Also in the vertical section we have the math functions. As operators we have addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, Fourier transformation, the derivative, integral and square root. The sources for the operator are selected here. The result can be inverted, scaled and moved vertically. It is shown as a white curve. For the derivative we can change the step size. I'd rather like it consistently as dt with seconds as unit. The integral is integrated starting from the left screen corner. For it to be more useful we can set up a gate. The feature can be used for example to calculate power consumption. Really interesting is the fast Fourier transformation which allows a basic frequency analysis. Without being sophisticated on it, we can set 5 different window functions, place and zoom the graph horizontally and vertically and change unit and load. We can also switch to full screen like that. The display method can be changed to average to get a clean curve or maximum hold. To reset the maximum as in other functions, the clear sweeps button can be used. At 1 giga samples, the maximum frequency calculated is 500 MHz. That's already at the Nyquist frequency. And we can expect some aliasing artifacts at the higher range. Using the autoset function, the center is placed at the highest peak automatically. What I'm missing here are the statistics that give a list of strongest peaks. Our 50 MHz source is detected flawlessly and we can also see some harmonics. If you don't analyze high frequency stuff, this feature could spare you buying a spectrum analyzer. I definitively like it. Let's test it with the AM radio transmitter project I made. These are the rickroll audio frequencies. And this is the carrier frequency. And this is the PAL carrier frequency from my composite video project. Cool. Overall, I'm not missing much in the math functions. The last function in the vertical system are the reference waveforms. We can basically take a snapshot of our current reference signal, store it in one of the four slots and display it. Except for being a visual reference we can use it for measurements. But it can't be selected as a source in the math functions, which would be a nice addition. The time can be scaled between 1 nanosecond and 100 seconds per division. What I don't really like for filming is that this overlay stays on for quite a long time and obstructs the view. The trigger positioning is indicated by the small arrow and can be moved using the small knob. Pushing it will reset it to the center. Pushing the big knob we can activate a split screen view where we can adjust a zoom area. The zoom area can also be used in measurements. If we like to see the signal on the fly, we can use the roll function. This is especially useful for long acquisitions, otherwise we would have to wait for the acquisition to be completed before it's shown. The search function can be used to search for specific waveform events like edge, slope, pulse, interval and round. It's quite similar to the trigger, we can even copy the settings, but the advantage is that it indicates all the events by an arrow and even displays the event count. We can navigate through all the events by pressing the navigate button. Let's get to one of the most important features of oscilloscopes, the triggers. The trigger helps to filter and display the events of the signal we are interested in. We have three trigger modes. Auto always displays the current waveform. Normal shows the latest snapshot where the trigger occurred. 
Single mode stops the acquisition at the first time the trigger is set off. The trigger level is changed using this knob and is reset to zero pushing it. In the setup we can find a vast selection of trigger types and options. We have edge, slope, pulse, video, window, interval, dropout, round, pattern and serial. Each trigger is explained by an overlay picture. That's nice. We can change every aspect of each type and even use some noise rejection. Let's check out the video trigger with the non-interlaced PAL from my self-made ESP32 game console. There is a menu which video standards we are using. Since non-interlaced PAL is not a standard because it's just using one field, there is even the option to select a custom video standard. There we can specify the frame rate, the line number, interlace, and where to sync. That's quite helpful since we can select a specific row of a specific field. Nice! There are many other triggers targeting each aspect of a signal and its integrity. I don't want to bore you with every detail now. If you like to have a specific one revisited in the next part, tell me in the comments. However, the two last ones are quite interesting. The pattern trigger allows to perform logical operations on the four channels. We can combine each of them. This way we can trigger events that are related to multiple sources. The serial trigger is extremely useful when debugging serial protocols. It supports I2C, SPI, UART, CAN and Linbus types. We can test a simple gyro reading over I2C here. First of all we can set our signal levels. It's preset automatically. Our signal level is at 3.3 volts. The simplest trigger condition would be the start of the transmission. But we can even filter specific events like when the transmission is not acknowledged or a specific address is written or read from. And this brings us to the next big topic, the decoding. We can perform a decoding of two serial protocols at once and display the data on the screen. I have here a simple ESP8266 setup with a gyro. The ESP is reading the gyro values over I2C and sending text over UART. Here is where having four probes comes handy. Once again we can set the signal levels and the sources. At the bottom of the screen we get the decoded events displayed. Here the write of the address and here the read of the 14 data bytes. The update rate is around twice a second. In the case of this gyro it would be nice to have the possibility to increase the update rate to see the movement in the data values. On the second page we have the possibility to display a list which shows the events. There is also the possibility to change the display format and to link the decoding to the trigger. Setting up the UART we have the RX and the TX. We have to specify the baud rate and the bit options. And on the second page we have the bit order and this idle level. What I would really like is to have the data format separated for each decoder. So I could use hex for I2C and ASCII for UART. The decoder seems to work nicely, especially with all the configuration options we can tweak. Wow, that was a lot of stuff already. Still we have another important topic. The measurements. Basic measurements can be performed using the cursors. I have used this feature in my previous video to measure timings. We can measure vertically and horizontally or activate a tracking function which sets the vertical position of the corners to the signal level. The measurements are displayed in this small window. The placement is not very optimal since there is always a signal in the center. We can change the transparency of the window but then both background and the front have bright colors. The sophisticated measurements can be done from the measure menu. It supports measurements on all channels, zoom areas, the math result and even on the first reference waveform. There are 28 measurement types which I explained down here. Using the general purpose knob we can enable them one by one. The first four measurements are displayed here. The font indicates the specific source. To display all selected measurements we can turn on the statistics which also will display the min, max, mean and standard deviation. To limit the measurement area there is also a gate option. If you like the complete overview, an overlay with all values can be shown. The result of the fast Fourier transformation is limited to the peak measurement. There are also 10 measurement types between two channels. 
For example, we can measure the delay we get when routing the trigger from the trigger output to the third channel over this 2 meter cable. Next on the list are the acquisition modes. We have normal, peak detect, average and enhanced resolution. Peak is used for capturing min-max at the same time. Average and enhanced resolution is for noise cancellation. We can change the memory depth here. This affects the sampling rate of the scope and the count of frames we can capture. The lower the resolution, the higher the count of frames. On the second page we have the interpolation mode for the waveform display and the option to disable the hardware acceleration for whatever reason. The sequence mode can be used to capture a higher count of waveforms. Each trigger captures a segment. The display is just updated once all segments are recorded. The recordings can be reviewed using the history function, which we will take a look on in a minute. The last acquisition mode is the XY mode. Let's test it with my oscilloscope as a display project. It works as expected, but I'm missing the intensity or an untriggered mode with a shorter persistence setting. But that's something you would just need for displaying graphics. Most of the other functions are disabled for XY mode. Let's check the display settings. We can switch from vectors to dots, which represent each sample taken. Then we have the color grade. That's a nice method to see signal hotspots in red. The third setting is for changing the persistence of the display. As mentioned before, I would like to have values shorter than one second here. The persistence, especially infinite, can be cleared using the clear button. On the second page we have all the UI settings. Using the save recall button we can save and restore our scope settings as well as export acquisitions to binary, CSV and MATLAB formats. I have tested the CSV. We definitively can use the acquisitions for further processing. The history function can be used to review the frames that have been automatically recorded before the acquisition has stopped. They can be played as an animation and also be displayed in a list with the precise acquisition time. The navigate button can also be used to browse through the history frames. Under utilities we can find the system related settings, the self calibration, self test and the management for the add-ons which we will cover another time. Last feature for today is the pass-fail test, which could be used for automated test setups. Let's say we have a reference device which gives us the desired signal. We can capture a mask using specified margins, which we can store and restore to test other signals. The test is performed each trigger. If the waveform is within the mask, it is a pass. If it touches the mask, it's a fail. This feature seems to be quite new, since it seems to be buggy, which I hope will be fixed in a firmware update. When capturing the mask, there is a bug at the screen corners, which will result in test fails. And also there should be a signal at the BNC connector on the back when it fails. But I wasn't able to get anything. It turns off the trigger output, but does nothing else. I think this feature should be refined. This ended up being a really detailed review, so let's come to a conclusion. In my opinion, this scope is really competitive in its price point and sets new standards. Regardless of the bugs that can be fixed with further firmware updates, it doesn't lack any functionality a semi-professional like me would need. All protocol decoders, triggers, math functions and measurements are there. What do you think is the best feature and which one is missing? Tell me in the comments. And if you are a subscriber before this was uploaded, you can win this scope. Just write a comment what you need it for. If you are new to my channel or missed the draw, just subscribe to not miss the next giveaway and all the other cool projects coming next. I hope you found this informative, at least I learned a lot of new stuff. See you next time, bye!